Thank you very much. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to the stage the writer of Shame, Abby Morgan, and the director and writer, Steve McQueen. Abby, Steve, thank you very much for being here this evening. Thank you very much for the film as well. Um, I'm going to give a very quick introduction uh, to both of you for the benefit of everybody here. Um, Steve, as I said before, is the director and the co-writer of Shame. Um, which is, Shame is his second feature after 2008's Hunger. And uh, Steve is also an artist who works largely with a moving image, but not exclusively. Abby Morgan is the co-writer of Shame. Um, she's written widely for television, cinema and theatre, and her work includes the films Brick Lane and The Iron Lady and the TV series The Hour. Um, for those who haven't seen Shame, I'll give a very, very quick rundown. As you may gather from the trailer there, the film focuses around one character, Brandon, played by Michael Fassbender. He's a bachelor, he's a professional in New York City, and we follow his life over a very short period of time in the modern day city. Um, I'm not going to say any more than that. Well, more will come out during the discussion, I think. Um, Steve and Abby, as we've got you both here tonight, um, this is a film which you very much conceived together through, through discussion. So I'd, I'd like to uh, begin by asking about that. How, if you could, one of you could begin by telling, maybe Abby, the, the, those early conversations you had with Steve, out, out of which the idea for this film came. Um, well, I'd always been a huge admirer of Steve's work, both as an artist and then subsequently as a filmmaker on Hunger. And so when the opportunity arose for us to meet, and I think we just met for a coffee initially, yeah. it was, you know, I think the sense was we were going to meet, it was one of those kind of meet and greet things you do, and we'll probably move on, never work together again. But um, it, was just, it was just one of those wonderful yeah. things where you just connect. And, that, and for me, that was the starting point. So what should have been our conversation was three hours. And we just kind of riffed on things that were preoccupying us. We talked about life, family, friends, love, yeah. sex, and... And I think that was that was the sort of genesis, really. The whole shebang, the kitchen sink, everything. <laughs> I mean, it was just one of those. It was very kind of uh, lethargic in a way. It was one of those things where just sort of everything came out. Uh, maybe it was a strange on a plane, and um, we just got on and we started to talk and talk and talk. And uh, what came out of it was this idea of uh, basically sex addiction. You know, that's the thing that sort of stood out in our conversation. And we, I think, both of us went away, came back, and thought, actually, this is actually an interesting idea. Where, where was your head at at that time in terms of a filmmaker? You'd made Hunger, it came out, uh, it did very well at Cannes in 2000, 2008, it came out, it won many awards, so I imagine you were thinking about what to do as your second film. Did you have, you were obviously looking for a subject and out of this conversation, shame emerged, did you, but did you have any strong ideas as to areas you wanted to explore, tones you wanted to explore, any, anything? Well, were, you, were you just very open-minded? I was interested in not having a gun in a movie. It's about things which affect us all, which is sex. And um, it's just one of those things where, um, as I say, I thought that is much more familiar with the, to us than some e exotic uh, idea of, of some sort of chase movie with, 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 with a gun. I just wanted to deal with things which we were all involved in rather than something which is some, so sort of, um, I don't know, so, sort of far-fetched in a way. I've, I've read somewhere that, Steve, when Abby first mentioned the idea of sex addiction or a film about sex addiction to you, that your first instinct was, was to laugh. I'm curious to know, why, why looking back now, why, why do you think you had that reaction? <laughs> because it's going, I'm laughing now. <laughs> I'm a bit nervous, but I'm, I'm, I'm laughing now because, it, again, it, the whole idea was funny. I mean, you know, it, 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 initially it was, it was funny to me, sex addiction, oh yeah, all right. But then you get to a situation where you find out in order to, for a person to, to get through a day, similar to an alcoholic, you know, this person is, is downing a bottle of vodka a day. When you realize that someone has relieved themselves, say, 25 times a day, um, it ceases to become funny. It's, mm. it's kind of tragic. And Abby, was that an area of sex addiction which you'd already researched, you were already thinking about as a, as that had potential for, you know, for a work, you know, for um, TV or for film? What, one of the great parts of the collaboration with Steve was actually it's a man and a woman and it was wonderful to talk so openly about sex and to, you know, we're, we're, we both have partners, we both have children, so in a way there was a kind of great neutral ground. So I think... Those, it came out of those initial conversations, but I also think, you know, what's fascinating about this kind of addiction is, you know, unlike vodka, you know, alcohol, whatever it is, you know, like drugs, there is, you can take yourself out of the room from it. It's very hard to take yourself out of the room from sex, you know, because you're, mm. you're, you're talking about something which in order to live and breathe is to be a sexual being, you know, and so it, it's, it's, you know, I think what's interesting about the film is, is sex is, 
sex is the mechanics, but really it's about intimacy and it's about the, the struggle for intimacy. And I think, you know, I think when you work with an artist like Steve who is so open to that kind of emotion. It was, it was just a joy to work with a director who, could, who allowed me to be that open. You know, they, those are my secret thoughts that I maybe share with one or two friends when I'm drunk. Well, to find, a, find someone who can, can actually translate that into work was really exciting. Uh, Steve, on one level, I think it is fair to describe the film as a film about sex addiction, but I think that also does it a disservice. I mean, there must have been a point where, after you discussed the subject, You'd, you'd researched it, you'd spoken to people, which I know you did. You have to chuck all that research away to turn it into a character study, to turn it into a work of art. Because yeah. it can't, I mean, a, a good film can't feel like it's laden with, with research or laden with an issue, and this doesn't at all. So was there a point where you had to throw that away and, and take, another, take another direction? No, because the character was always in my mind from day one. Mm. But the research was, 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 of course, I mean, we didn't know where we were going at first. It was like sort of walking into a room with all the lights out, and having to sort of, you know, you know, tripping and fumbling our way through the room, trying to find the, the architecture of the room, trying to find a sort of uh, the geography of the room, because mm. we had no idea. Again, I, I kept on saying we were like Miss Marple and Columbo, trying to find clues. And then, you know, you, you, after a while, you got an understanding of, 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 of your environment. And that's exactly what it was about. Brandon was with us all from, from, from day one. Mm. But with that information laid on top of it, he, 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 we, we, we sort of, how can I say fine, we kind of tailored the suit for him <coughs> to all the information that, 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 that we were sort of um, um, uh, finding out at the time. Mm. Let's talk a little bit more about Brandon and how Michael Fassbender plays him in a second. But first, we're going to see a couple of clips this evening. And I'd like to introduce the first clip, which I believe sees Brandon on a subway train in New York. Yeah. I think that's a, um, I mean, a fascinating and a very powerful scene. I mean, when, for those of you, when you see the, the whole film, I think you'll agree. Um, all the more powerful for the fact it's played out entirely through the sequence, it's played out entirely through looks and glances and no dialogue at all, and with that terrific music on it as well. Steve, to go back to the character of Brandon, as we see him played by Michael Fassbender in the film, you, you said that that character came to you, it was there quite early on. And I'm curious to know, um, as, you, as you came to this character through deciding to make this film about sex addiction, some of the key decisions you make are one, that he's male, you know, two, that he's a successful career person and three that he's outwardly charming and, and sociable how, how did you how do you find that you honed on those three things i think it's a we thing myself and yeah, no, so, uh, um, i think no, you could answer sure. please yeah. no I, I think um what it, you know i think you know someone asked me before you know he, you know it'd be much more interesting if it was someone who was you no know, married and you know not particularly attractive and stuff like that i think it, that that would be the ultimate cliche i feel that with, with brandon being attractive being six relatively successful um and a good job that you have someone who has everything. And why would you sort of, in some ways, destroy your everything by doing something as, you know, as futile as sort of, you know, sleeping around in, in a way which is not, 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 not everyone sleeps, people sleep around, it's, it's, that's great, being promiscuous, not a problem. But what I mean by that is having such an addiction uh, in, in a way that it destroys you. Uh, when you have everything, why would you think it actually destroys you? And that's, 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 that's the question. I think, you know, it's, it's a question about, you know, how we live today, and I think it's, you know, when you have everything, you know, it, it's, it's kind of strange, it's a difficult question to actually answer, but someone like that, I think, you would imagine, who has everything, wouldn't want to sort of, in some ways, sort of um, destroy themselves through, say, drugs or alcohol, but sexual addiction, it just was just fascinating to me. And, I mean, do you feel the same, that the fact that he had this, this outwardly sex, uh, successful and sociable exterior made him much more in made him interesting to explore in terms of the reality of his private life. I think you're just talking about a different film, but I mean, yeah. I, I think from the experience of many of the men that we met, what was absolutely fascinating was that I did go in with a lot of preconceptions, and mm. you know, I think there is the preconception yeah. of the man who wants to rebel, who wants to sleep with other women because he's tied to a, mar a marriage. And what was fascinating to me were you know, the stories of the men who were married to their wives and desperate to sleep with them but couldn't. They preferred to sleep with a prostitute or the man, you know, yeah. or, or the successful single man who had it all or the, you but know, the guy who'd lost all his money because sure. he, you know, they were so varied. And so mm. for me, I think Brandon is a kind of everyman. But Brandon is somehow, I think, a kind of, you know, he's brand new to some extent. He's made his decision. He doesn't want to sort of be in relationships. Mm. He, doesn't want to, he doesn't want children. He's very happy to have his job and to ha have, basically he controls his life. Completely by him, sort of being in this, in this capsule of his, of, of, of having, having, having the, the job which needs the money to sort of buy him stuff. He's in his apartment doing what he wants to do, mm. and that's why when you bring in Sissy, his sister, who brings the past into the present, that's 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 the that's the friction. That's what it's it's being mm. disrupted. But Brandon is, I mean, there's loads of Brandons out there. He's, he's you know, to certain extent, he's brand new. 
You know, he's he's he isn't you know the guy with two kids and a dog. He he's he's he is the guy who's living alone, you know, on the internet, pornography, prostitutes, and so forth and whatnot. Mm. Uh, you mentioned there that his sister, played by Sissy, played by Kerry Mulligan, comes into the film. Yeah. Um, she's one key relationship in the film. Another one is more of a short-term one, when he goes out on a date with one of his colleagues. He invites her out on a date, which feels like a, he's, trying to, he's trying to exercise or uh, normalcy in some way. He's, try, he's, try, he's trying to live the life of a, you know, a, regular, a regular man, taking someone out on a date, having the conversation, etc., etc., rather than the encounters that we see him having throughout the rest of the film. Um, if we can see the second clip, we'll see um, him coming to the end of that date. Abby, as I, I said before the clip, that comes after a, a long and quite mm. revealing restaurant scene mm. between the two characters. I wonder if you could give that scene some context. What, why did you want to write Marianne, Marianne into, um, into Brandon's life? I mean, I think one of the key starting points when Steve and I talked about um, sex addiction was actually about, the, you know, we're, I mean, I, I love technology and, you know, mm. but the way that technology has guided, opened up, you know, portals into another world and the way the sort of social interaction of Facebook, um, tweeting, you know, the way mm. before you go out on a date, you probably can see 131 photos of the friends, the family, you know who they slept with, you, mm. you can trace them. And so actually there's a sort of naivety and uh, an originality, I think, to dating now. And I think in a way there's a sort of, um, there's a nervousness to Brandon because actually the very real and very normal um, form of interaction of a date actually eludes him, whereas I think we were exploring what happens in a world where sex has become commodified and to a certain degree finding relationships has become, um, you know, accessed through the internet. So I think that was sort of something that we, you know, was for me was very interesting to then go try and write the scene of what would this date be like. Did, did you feel that Brandon was challenging himself in some ways by going out on a regular date? Because it's not the easy way out we see for him is <laughs> not to do that, but it's to hire prostitutes or or masturbate, or go, or mm. uh, hire, or you know, mm. go to a lap dancing bar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This this seems to take more work for him, and it's also quite revealing to us. I think it's about yeah. him, you know the emotional, you know how you know how terrifying those dates can be. We've all been on a mm. terrifying date. Yeah. And I think also the fact that Sissy brings a lot with her to the to the table, and I think he he realizes he doesn't want to be like her. So he you know he wants to sort of have some kind of foundation at least, or, or, or attempt at having a foundation or attempt at having some kind of relationship. And uh, of course it doesn't, doesn't work out. And Sissy, the sister, um, to give more background, c comes into yeah. Brandon's life by Carrie quite, quite unexpectedly. Um, they're clearly, they're not as strange, but they're not close. She's looking for intimacy from him as a sister. He's unwilling to give it. And it's, their relationship certainly, it's quite tantalizing, I think, for an audience in terms of it, it it's, it's suggestive of a past. It's suggestive of their relationships as any brother and sister relationship would be. Um, but obviously, because your film is very much in the moment, it's immediate, you don't give those answers. But I'm curious to know whether you, dis you discuss that background between the two of you. With, and, yeah. also, and also, Steve, whether you share that, those discussions, if you do have them, with, um, with your cast. Maybe, Abby, could you talk about whether you have those discussions and, Steve, whether you share them? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the script went through several drafts and, you know, we, we threw away the first 60 pages, really, you know, mm. and so, and I think, you know, uh, you know, I think whether we have a backstory or not, which I think is an essential part when we were working on it, of course, you know, we, we mm. considered it, um, but I think it felt very important that we allowed an audience to to go wherever they wanted to, to come to their own conclusions. I mean, I think there's enough to know that there's obviously clearly some backstory and, but I think as soon as we tried to give this, this sort of backstory, it suddenly felt artificial, I think, and just, it just didn't, it didn't quite work for no, us. No, really. well, I, think, I think audiences are intelligent enough to, to know or to have an idea of what the situation possibly could, 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 could have been. Um, you know, again, when, you, when I'm introduced to someone for the first time, I have no idea who that person is. Maybe through getting to know them after a period of time, mm. I, get to, I get to find out that, that they're past through the present. That's exactly what I want to do with the film. I think it's the immediacy of the film that gives it its power as well. You have flashbacks in the film, but sometimes they're just between a period of you know, 10 minutes to another 10 minutes. I mean, they're not. Mm. The, the, the film is very, very you know, immediate and in the now, I think. Yeah, I think so. And also some of the film, some, some, well, how we filmed it was sometimes, a lot of the times it was in real time. I think that sort of gives it a certain kind of urgency, kind of presence. Steve, I'd like to ask you a um, key question about Michael Fassbender. Second time you've worked with Michael, he, he played Bobby Sands in Hunger. I mean, was it, was it very easy for you to go back and discuss him playing this character and you working with him again? Well, first of all, I, I, if, I, if I may, I'll talk about Kerry Mulligan, who was, was amazing. Um, I think Kerry, again, I knew I was working with two of the best actors of their generation. I mean, Kerry Mulligan is, is a phenomenal actor, uh, actress, 
um, and Michael Fassbender. So the whole idea of having those two in, in a movie together, you know, these two stones, you know, making fire, that was, that was the thing that really sort of obviously excited me as well. Um, Michael, is, yes, is our second project together. And yeah, he's, um, you know, I, I remember meeting for the first time, I didn't like him at all. So who's this guy, cocky guy, auditioning for Hunger? <laughs> he came back again, he was some, you know, the lights went on in the room, he was someone else. It's just a journey, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, it's, you know, what I love about Michael is that he is a person who isn't sure of himself in some ways, but is willing to try. And often when you're willing to try, you're not sure of something, you go further than you could possibly imagine. And I think that he's gone very, very far, obviously. Mm. And I think that's exciting, you know, when you don't know, but you try and you get there. Wow. And does, does that mean that when you come back and you come back to make a second film with someone, you have a kind of shorthand, you're, you're able to... Little he, bit. he understands you more, you, oh. know, you, you know his boundaries, or you know, you know where you can push him to. A little bit, a little bit. The boundaries, I mean, you know, the boundaries are sort of, I don't know if, if the boundaries are there. I mean, it's, it's only when he starts shouting at me if, if he does that, or I start shouting at him if he doesn't do it. There are no boundaries to an extent. It's just about, you know, it's, it's, you find things out. If, you, if, you, if you, it doesn't feel right that way, then you turn, you turn the other way. It's just about right. feeling and finding things out. So... It's one of those things where we, we are willing to take a risk and we're willing to try and willing to make ourselves look like idiots. But you know, all for making the, the work sort of into something hopefully interesting. That's what it's all about, you know, getting your hands dirty. Would anyone like to ask a question? I'm, I'm interested in the aesthetic of, of the film. A lot of it's filmed at night and uh, it's got a kind of blue filter effect to it. And when you looked at that street scene from the last clip, um, the focus is on the characters, and the background is relatively soft focus, but there are lots of kind of lights protruding through, and it's got a kind of dream quality to it, and a kind of immersive quality. And also, I noticed the soundtrack kind of resonates, so you're drawn kind of physically into the, into the story. My question is, how do you decide on the aesthetic? I've noticed films have changed since, say, Vertigo, Hitchcock's Vertigo, well, you're obviously looking at something from the outside, something quite brightly lit, and it seems kind of stagey. But more recently, the characters kind of suck you yeah. in, and, 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 and the camera okay. follows the camera, uh, okay. follows, follows the, the faces. How do you decide on yeah. the aesthetic, and how do you achieve the aesthetic? Well, it's, it's all about the, the story. The story, the character and the story dictate to me. And it's also, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a big sort of... Uh, Compliment to Sean Bobbitt, the, the cameraman, um, who I, I've been working with for 11 years. I mean, for example, that street scene you just saw, uh, there, there's, it's, it's all natural lighting. It's all, the lights that are, are available in the streets, that's how we shot it. Um, so there's no sort of, there's no, there's no big rig or lighting procedure. It's all natural light, source, source lights, street lights, um, shops lights. Um, but what it is about the aesthetic in some ways, it's all, it's all about how... I mean, I don't like to put a stencil onto a subject matter. The subject matter has to tell me what it wants. So, you know, I don't do storyboards, for example. Sometimes I would turn up and we have no idea what to do, but we feel out, the actors will, will go through their pace, how they feel they, 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 they'll be in a frame, and maybe redirect them, and then we go, go, let's shoot, let's just go for it. It's, it's sometimes, oh, I see something, or we look for something, oh, wow, it's there, 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 there it is, there it is. And you, 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 you put the camera there. But for example, uh, very quickly, a very good example of that is somehow, how the sort of architecture and the circumstances dictate the images is, for example, um, the apartment that Brandon has. It's a very small apartment, and that sort of cramped, claustrophobic sort of um, uh, uh, space, but at the same time, with these huge vistas, meaning with the windows, looking out into the open uh, uh, landscape of Manhattan, is a wonderful, interesting contrast of this condensed, but at the same time, this expanse. And that kind of dictates to you sometimes where to put the camera. And uh, in some ways, it, it's, it's, you're, you're limited, but that limitation is, is actual freedom. On the back of that question, actually, Steve, how, you, you shot this film in New York. I mean, how, in some ways, New York offers up the infinite in terms of the city. I mean, how, so what were your feelings about how you wanted to shoot New York, how you wanted to incorporate the city into it? Do you uh, feel you had to have an approach no, key I, in your mind? My, the, 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 what I had, thought I had to have was ritual. Hmm. Following Brandon, that was it. Following Brandon, that ritual. I mean, you know, we were very um, uh, loyal to the geography of the city. I mean, that's it. I mean, a lot of New Yorkers will see, if they know, obviously, they, they will see, they'll hopefully see the film, have seen the film, they'll see that it's very loyal to the geography. Mm. How you would travel to work, how you would you know, come off the train to, to, go, to go home and so forth and whatnot. 
I just wanted to be very loyal to 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 to, to that. It's like Tai Chi. All you gotta do is just, is just follow it, and so it, can, it can be it can be poetic at the same time. But just just by being loyal to the city, it doesn't it? You know, even the ugly bits are beautiful. Mm. You know. So it's about being loyal to Brandon City. It's about knowing what Brandon City is and then being loyal to that and following. Yeah, that he's ritual for sure. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Uh, why, what made you choose it in the States? Were there some sort of clauses on that? Or why didn't you choose it in the UK? Um, to be honest, we couldn't get anyone to talk to us over here. I mean, sec sex addiction isn't recognised in the same way as it is in America. And, you know, when we started writing the film, it was when there was a lot of furore around the Tiger Woods story. And I think there was a sort of reluctance to go there. And, and then I think when we went to New York in many ways, you know, uh, we talked to a number of... Um, experts in the field and obviously you know uh, people who suffered from this addiction and um and i think actually you know steve knew new york, new york really well i didn't know it so well but you know steve lives in Amsterdam, i live in london so f you know creatively it was really interesting and you know when you talk about walking brandon's journey brandy's roots it, it, you know we, we spent a lot of time walking around new york together talking i mean that was a big part of writing this film was just sort of you know you know just kind of walking along pavements and discussing so um, I think it informed it, uh, you know, I think it informed the writing as well. So Abby, you obviously had to be there for part of it. Did, did you actually write some of the film there in New York? Did you, did you locate yourself there to Yeah, I mean, I wrote, you know, I wrote a lot, yeah. I mean, we wrote together, but you know, there were large chunks of that film were, were made in the Standard Hotel, which is mm. where, you know, the, the, some of the key scenes are shot. And, yeah. um, you know, it has an incredible view over the Hudson and there's an amazing um, kind of refuse um, center where there are kind of constant refuse trunks Mm -hmm. coming backwards and forwards and I think you know as a landscape it was it, it was very key and so some of the key sequences you you see around that that area so and, and, and did one last question about New York actually Steve I mean you cast uh, an Irish actor Michael Fassbender and a British actor Kerry Mulligan to play these parts Does, in any did you feel that actually in some ways stresses the you know the outsider nature of everybody in New York. I mean, everybody's an immigrant to New York mm. in some sense. Every, everybody, people are passing through, whether it's over several generations or in the past, the past six months. Mm. I mean, in some ways, do you, do you think it somehow adds to that sense? Absolutely. Often the case when you, you know, you, you've got a character in, a, in, a, in a, an American film, a New York film, it's a New Yorker or mm. whatever. It's American rather. Um, and I thought, wow, wh why not? Why does he have to lose? Why does Michael lose, lose his accent? Why? Mm. You know, he's, 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 you know, he could be, I mean, most New Yorkers that I know are from everywhere else other than America. So it, was, it, it felt quite, quite, um, quite obvious to me. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah two questions. Um, firstly, um, the scene we saw, like, in the, in the underground, I was just wondering if that was actually filmed in the underground, and if it was um, the uh, actual logistics in doing that, because it sounds like that might be a logistical nightmare. And secondly, um, what's... Steve's plans in the, in the future? I mean, have you got any other films in the pipeline? Good question. So, Subway and your, your future plans? Um, the, the Subway was um, quite difficult, but the authorities were extraordinarily helpful, really helpful, and uh, that was a big day. I don't know, I think we had, I don't know, I mean, actually, I, mean, actually, I think we had like 300 or 300, mm. three or 400 extras, and uh, that was a big day. Um, and at the, at, you know, it was a bit mind boggling at first because the biggest scene I ever shot. So it was myself and Sean, Barbet, and, and all, all the crew were there. So it was one of those things where I had to get my head around it a little bit. You know, subways, we could only go two stops and get off and come back on. And, you know, I, whoa, you know, so my head was spinning for, for, for the first three hours. My head was spinning and then I got a grip of it. But it was, uh, yeah, it was, um, it, it was just wonderful that, that, that we were allowed to sort of shoot on a real subway. And, and okay, and that's a part of the ritual, you know, and that's a part of the situation where, for example, the lady on the train, and not to spoil it for people who haven't seen it, but we see her again at the end of the movie. And it's not that coincidence, because those coincidences happen in New York very often in this grid system and, of course, commuting, as we all do here. Um, as far as what I'm doing in the future, um, I'm, I'm, I'm making a film called 12 Years a, Sa 12 Years a Slave um, with um, Chiwetel and um, Michael Fassbinder and, and Brad Pitt. I'm shooting that in the summer. Uh, before we wrap up, Abby, I think it's only fair to ask uh, the same question to you about your future plans. Um, you, do, you do have the film of your script of The Iron Lady in cinemas no, now I in do. the UK. Uh, and um, I'm doing a new film about uh, Charles Dickens' secret love affair with Ray Fiennes. And um, I'm writing the second series of The Hour, which is shooting at the moment. Excellent. Um, I'm going to wrap up there. I want to thank Steve McQueen, Abby Morgan, and thank you for coming along. Thank you very much. <laughs>